Hello, everyone, and thank you for tuning in to our New Jersey Prescribed Burning Awareness Training Part 2. My name is Christine Hall, and I'm the State Resource Conservationist for the New Jersey Natural Resources Conservation Service, also known as NRCS. This training session is being provided thanks to a collaboration between the New Jersey Forest Fire Service, New Jersey Fire Safety Council, and the USDA NRCS. Nationwide, NRCS supports and encourages the use of prescribed burning on all lands where it can be used to meet specific resource management objectives. To use the prescribed burning conservation practice, we require our planners to complete an initial awareness level certification. This involves 16 hours of training, addressing the principles of planning and safely executing a prescribed burn, as well as the effects the fire will have on soil, water, air, plant, and animal resources, and the communities within the burn area. New Jersey offered a two-day training session in January 2020. That training, along with this webinar, will complete the 16-hour training requirement. For today's training, we will hear from Jeremy Weber, who is the Assistant Division Forest Fire Warden with the New Jersey Forest Fire Service. Jeremy will be presenting on prescribed burn tools and techniques. After that, we'll hear from Betsy McShane and Evan Madlinger, who are both biologists with New Jersey NRCS. Betsy and Evan will highlight the conservation practices related to prescribed burning and use a few project examples to illustrate how we can use those practices together in a conservation plan. I want to extend a huge thank you to our speakers who have worked hard to put together a great training session for you and have been so flexible as we have worked through the challenges of putting this webinar on. With that, I will turn it over to Jeremy Weber to cover the hot topic of prescribed burning tools and techniques. Good afternoon, morning, wherever, however it may be. Uh, my name is Jeremy Weber, as Christine said. I'm with the New Jersey Forest Fire Service and I'm the coordinator of the Prescribed Fire Program in the state of New Jersey. Um, today I'm going to be talking about the, uh, some of the tools and tech firing techniques that are used in prescribed fire and also how to implement a prescribed burn plan. Some of the tools or one of the primary tools for conducting prescribed fire is putting fire on the ground. How do you put fire on the ground? You, putting fire on the ground requires the use of what we call a drip torch. There are currently three different styles of handheld drip torches that the New Jersey Forest Fire Service uses as well as other prescribed burn practitioners. Um, those styles are what we call the Western style, which is your typical um, drip torch that is recognized across the country, uh, the Cranko drip torch, which is a version of uh, drip torch that the New Jersey Forest Fire Service utilizes, and the Panama style drip torch. As you can see on this slide, the Panama has a little bit of a uh, spoon on the top. so. That spoon allows for fire to be kind of uh, pulled there and tossed. Um, unfortunately, we don't have any videos for the Panama style drip torch, but there will be two videos um, on the Western and the Cranko style drip torches. So people wonder, what are the fuel mixes that are necessary for um, putting prescribed fire on the ground? Well, the different style drip torches use different styles of fuel mixture. So the Western and Panama drip torches tend to use a three to one diesel to gas mixture. However, the Cranko, which is the New Jersey style um, drip torch, uses straight gas. Um, the design of the, uh, the units um, accommodate for these different types of fuel mixtures. Now we will watch a video, a short video on uh, the Western style trip torch, some uh, uses and uh, safety concerns with that. This is a drip torch. And we are gonna cover the proper assembly, disassembly and storage techniques of it. Uh, Unscrew the brass cap, lay it down, preferably where it's not in the mud, and you'll pull the wick assembly out of the drip torch container, and on 
on the back side there's a thumb screw with a small chain on it. You unscrew that out of the tube that feeds the wick and then there's a threaded part right next to it that you screw it into to keep it out of the way and keep it from rattling around. The handle is facing towards me here. You set the wick assembly on top of the drip torch with this pigtail facing opposite of the handle. Put the brass lid back on top and thread it down so it's snug. It doesn't have to be just real tight. Just snug. And the small brass fitting here on the end is an air vent. And in order to allow the drip torch fuel to run out of the igniter here onto the wick, you unscrew it about a turn. And that allows air to go in and, and fuel to run out. You pick it up by the handle, and as you tip the wick down, you allow some fuel to run out of the, the tube assembly onto the wick, so it's well saturated. When you have the proper mix, you can run some fuel out on the ground, and then light it, and you have your drip torch ignited and ready to begin ignition. To extinguish the drip torch, the proper way, or several ways to do it, you can oftentimes just blow on it or just grab it like that with your gloved hand and snuff it out. Uh, when completed with your burn line, turn the air set screw down, shut it off. When your end is cool, and for proper storage, take the brass ring off the top, pull the ring off, and you invert the wick assembly back into the torch for storage. And then at the same time, take this thumb screw out of the holder mechanism and you put it back into the threaded assembly so your fuel doesn't leak out when you're transporting it to the next job. And then screw down the brass ring, like I say, snug. It's got an O-ring in there. You don't have to really bear down on it. And now you're ready for transport to the next job. Now that we've seen the Western style drip torch, um, we will have a short video on the Cranko style drip torch, which is the one that the New Jersey Forest Fire Service primarily utilizes. So this is the um, drip torch that New Jersey oh, Forest Fire going. Service uses. It's manufactured in-house. Uh, it has quite a few similarities to the Western torch, but a few differences. The first is it has a, a what we call the wand where the actual fuel drips out the end. There is no wick on the end. We find that the wick sometimes can uh, carry fire and stays lit longer than we'd like it to. Uh, because our fuel bed is a little bit more receptive, we don't need the, the wick to maintain fire. Uh, we do use a 50-50 gas diesel mix, a uh, quarter turn valve to regulate the flow, a vent that goes into the handle so we don't have a boom, and um, Obviously, the fill cap here, and we usually use a metal fill cap because sometimes they do get warm and the plastic ones seem to melt. Um, holds about a gallon and a half to two gallons of fuel, and um, we're going to grab some fire here and get, show you how it works. So, as you can see, the fuel's ignited, it's coming out the end of the wand, and it's called a drip torch. It's a little bit more than a drip, but uh, as we can regulate that, as Steve's doing there, by uh, turning back the quarter turn valve. And you can see a little bit less fuel is coming out now if we need to conserve fuel on a longer line. Uh, but right now we find that we need a, a little bit more fuel to carry. So he's going to open it up a little bit more. And we're a lot closer to our fuel source now for refueling purposes. 
Now, Steve, if you don't mind, just show them what to do when you want to extinguish it to, to make it safe. There you go. Snuff it out with your hand or blow it out. That way there's no accidental uh, ignitions on the opposite side of the line. And if you just grab some more fire and pick it back up again, we'll continue lighting. Again, uh, it's uh, a copy of a torch, what was formerly known as a Cranko. Uh, it's a New Jersey manufactured torch. It's a little different than the Western torch. Some things to take into account when conducting or prescribing prescribed fire is what are the fire effects that your resource objective is intended to accomplish. Um, to achieve certain fire effects, you have to think about flame length, fire intensity, um, duration of the fire. Um, all the different firing techniques have varying levels of intensity, residence time, consumption, um, and also influence uh, smoke dispersion and lift of the, of the smoke produced from a prescribed fire. The longer the, the flame lengths, the, typically the more intense the fire is. The shorter the flame lengths, the less intense the fire is. However, intensity and fire severity are not directly correlated. Fire severity, which meaning a fire that has great direct and indirect effects, can be very uh, low intensity fires, can have high severity um, effects to the, the vegetation. And the large part of that has to do with consumption and the residence time of that flaming um, fire front as it um, crosses the path of um, vegetation. Um, another factor that influences uh, the flame and its dimensions is the fuel bed density and its arrangement. The, uh, the continuity of those fuels and the arrangement and size of those fuels or fuel bed um, directly correlate with fire intensity and also influence the consumption um, of those fuels when a fire does uh, go through there. Lastly, KBDI, which is a measure of the Keith Byram Drought Index, looks at the dryness of the soil. The dryness of the soil, how it may not sound like it um, reflects directly on prescribed fire, it does, because as fire crosses the, the surface of um, the landscape, the higher the KBDI number or the higher the drought index is, the higher the likelihood of that fire traveling into the ground itself. And as fire travels subsurface into the, the ground, it will potentially um, burn up or cook to that residence time of 140 degrees Fahrenheit, the roots in the, uh, the soil layer of, uh, of that burn unit. As those roots are, are burned or, um, or cooked, so to speak, they will have uh, direct effects or indirect effects um, to the vegetation above it. Uh, sometimes they develop mortality of a, a tree or shrub species, or it may um, show uh, dieback in portions of that uh, plant species. So the five firing techniques that we're going to cover are backing fire, heading or strip head, flanking fire, point or dot source fire, and lastly, ring fire. These techniques are the, the basis of conducting prescribed fire. Each of these techniques allow for different fire effects to be achieved based on different environmental and um, fuel bed parameters that are um, evident on each, each and every different site. So the first 
firing technique backing fire. We're going to watch a short video here, and it'll go through the process of how a backing fire is, uh, is lit and carried out in the prescribed fire. In a backing fire, the fire moves against the wind. Backing fires exhibit the slowest rate of speed and the lowest intensity. Backing fires are always used at the beginning of a prescribed fire to create a black line. These black lines are formed on the downwind side of the site and enlarge the established fire lanes. They add an extra layer of protection and help prevent the fire from escaping. Backing fires typically have a slower rate of spread, shorter flame length, and less intensity than other techniques. Because backing fires move slower and tend to linger, they exhibit more complete fuel consumption than other techniques. These characteristics can also lead to damage or killing trees by cooking the root collar of the tree. Some of the factors that are associated with a backing fire, as with all um, firing techniques, you have to put in a baseline, and that baseline must be ignited along the downwind control side. So that may be a road, it could be a fire line, it could be um, it could be a mode path um, or an area that was leaf load. The initial baseline, as we call it, or black line that we work off of is, is critical to be established before either this unit or this type of firing technique or any of the other firing techniques that we will talk about is implemented because it helps give you uh, an area of safety or um, uh, control to work from and uh, base to the rest of your ignitions from. The backing fire technique is typically used in heavier fuels or in young stands. Because of the fire intensity is lower, it has minimal crown scorch that will occur because those intensities or those flame lengths are, are much uh, are reduced to a greater extent as in some of the other firing techniques that we will talk about. One of the downfalls of using backing fire is it's much slower as it moves across the landscape because as the, the fire is backing against the wind, it takes much longer for it to cover ground um, as it's backing through the wind. As as would be uh, different in a heading or flanking fire that we'll talk about. Because of that slower uh, movement across the landscape, um, you're going to spend a lot longer on the, on the site, and you're also going to need more control lines um, to be installed, which is going to increase your cost. One thing to note is backing fires are not flexible with the wind shifts once uh, the interior lines are inserted. As the backing fire is uh, progressing, the fire effects of it are typically uh, resource objective driven because you're looking for low intensity and um, typically a longer residence time for better consumption. If the wind were to shift 180 degrees or shift 45 degrees, you're gonna get a different fire effect because the intensity of that fire is gonna change as it progresses. So it is critical that you have sustained winds in a predominant direction when you're using backing fire. Typically, the in-stand wind speeds are one to three miles an hour. Um, in-stand wind speeds refers to the, uh, the actual air movement within a forest canopy or below the forest canopy at ground level. Um, the winds that are above a canopy are typically much greater, but because of all the surface tension and uh, restriction of air movement by trees or shrubs, that wind speed that's above the, uh, the canopy is reduced. So in general, one to three mile an hour in stand wind speeds is, uh, is a requirement for using backing fire. With prescribed fire using backing fire, fuels must be dry enough to the point that they will carry through because the lower intensity fire, there is not as much preheating happening 
um, or an intense intensity for uh, preheating to happen because of the type of uh, fire that's going through as it's back in across. So if the fuels are too wet, then the fire will not cross or carry through, and you'll likely get a dirty burn or a, more of a mosaic burn, and that likely will not be meeting your resource objective. With that fuel moisture, that fuel continuity is very, uh, very important too. Continuity being, are the fuels all together or is there patchiness? If there's patchiness, that will influence um, the ability for the backing fire to actually carry fire across the stand as well. One of the benefits of a backing fire is it doesn't take a lot of people to implement this strategy because one torch person is all that's needed to light control lines that are allowed to back on their own over the course of, uh, of the burn. So it takes the complexity out of it um, and makes it more manageable as well. The next firing technique that we'll be discussing is heading and or strip head fire. And that we have another nice short video here that will play that will demonstrate um, the heading and or strip head fire technique. In head fires, the fire travels in the same direction as the wind. Head fires produce the fastest rate of spread, highest flame lengths, and most intense fires. To manage this intensity, head fires are often set in strips. This is called a strip head fire. In this example, the wind is moving towards the west. Parallel lines of fire are created. Spacing of the lines depends on site characteristics, personnel, and goals. The first line is started on the downwind side of the site. Moving upwind, more lines are started. Wider spacing between lines will result in more intense fires. Closer spacing will mean less intense fires, but a longer time to complete the burn. Intensity will increase where two lines converge. Head fires are effective in forests with light fuel loads because they move quickly past the root collars instead of lingering at the tree base. Familiarity with fires is more critical when using head fires because the fire will often move faster than a human can run. Head fires also tend to throw more embers in the air, which can be carried by the wind and lead to fire getting out of the desired area. However, because of the faster rate of spread, head fires allow experienced burning crews to be more efficient. Now, some of the factors that are associated with strip head or heading fires are, again, you have to light that initial downwind baseline before using any other um, firing techniques. As was demonstrated with the backing fire, that is the technique that needs to be implemented on that baseline prior to um, utilizing any other firing technique. One of the advantages of the stripper heading fire technique is it can keep the cost lower because the fire progresses across the unit much quicker than it does with a, a backing fire. Now, Winds don't have to be as strong as they do with the uh, backing fire, but they should be enough to give the fire its direction. Um, so one to two mile an hour in sand wind speeds are um, our desired um, level. If you get too high of an uh, in stand wind speed, you know, above two to three or even four miles an hour, that can create control problems because the fire will progress across the stand much quicker than is needed and could, could potentially create um, containment problems, keeping the fire in that predetermined area. Um, stripping or heading fires are not always suitable for different um, and, and heavier fuels. So you must first ask yourself, what are my objectives um, for the resource? What fire effects am I looking for? And if the resource objective can't be met using head fire, heading fire, then you should not consider use of a head fire. Now, heading and strip head fires, they can accommodate um, minimal wind shifts. 
45 degree wind shifts are acceptable because it's still progressing the, uh, the fire in the general direction. Now it is, it is critical to keep in mind that when you are using this firing technique that temperatures should be kept under 60 degrees, ambient air temperatures that are. Is the higher the air, ambient air temperature um, with this technique, the higher likelihood of control problems and crown scorch um, that can occur. Crown scorch is the browning or yellowing or uh, reddening of uh, pine needles in a, a stand. Um, because the air is not being able to disperse well, it basically cooks the, the crowns um, needles and they will die and fall off. Now, in some cases, it may kill the tree. In other cases, depending on the species, um, such as pitch pine, it is resilient, resilient and can deal with crown scorch better than other um, pine species, such as uh, like eastern white pine. In addition, stripping and head fires can be used in a wide range of fuel types. It can be used in, in grassy areas. It can be used in brushy areas. It can be used in uh, forest settings, um, Phragmites areas. Uh, it's, it's a very uh, very practical tool to be used in multiple fuel types. However, you, you do have to be cognizant of those fuel loads, um, regardless of the fuel type, and determine if this is the best appropriate firing technique to use to con conduct this prescribed burn. Um, as we spoke about with the backing fire technique, um, having to have uh, lower fuel moistures to be able to carry the fire well, um, with heading or strip head fire, you can actually burn with um, higher humidity levels, relative humidity levels in the air, and higher fuel moisture levels. Because of the intensity of the fire as it's progressing with the wind, um, creates longer flame lengths, it creates more BTUs that can inadvertently um, preheat those fuels in front of it quicker and reduce that fuel moisture in those fuels that it's going to advance on uh, much, much more efficiently than what a backing fire would um, accomplish. The next firing technique that we're gonna cover is flanking fire. Um, and we're going to watch a short video again on uh, demonstrating how flanking fire is implemented. In a flanking fire, personnel set lines of fire directly into the wind. The intensity of flanking fires is moderate, with less intensity than heading fires, but more intensity than backing fires. The intensity can be manipulated by adjusting space between the lines. Lines closer together will be less intense, while lines farther apart will be more intense. Just as with strip head fires, the intensity will increase when the two lines converge. Flanking fires require more personnel because all workers must carry the drip torch at the same time and walk the same speed. Flanking fires are used when winds are steady. Swirling winds can quickly turn a flanking fire into a strip head fire. Some of those factors associated with flanking fire, again, as with all techniques, this is getting re repetitive, you always want to secure that downwind baseline first with that backing fire before transitioning to other firing techniques. You know, get that black line in, as we call it. Um, fuel loads should be light to medium using this technique. Heavy fuel loads can get yourself into trouble because flanking fire uses more um, moderate to mixed intensity uh, fire intensity. Um, if you have too much fuel on the ground, that intensity can get more than what your uh, resurface objective or effects that you're looking for um, are going to create when using this technique. So keep in mind, Keep your fuel loading, you know, light to medium loads, not heavy loads. And then also think that you have to have a sustained wind direction because of the way the firing technique with uh, flanking fire is used. 
you need to make sure that there's not variable wind directions and it's sustained. If you have variable wind directions, the, the fire's flanks can turn to heads and back and forth and it can create containment issues. Um, now with this fire, because of there's very intensities in this uh, technique and creating more of mosaic burns as these, uh, these perpendicular strips are pulled through the unit, um, there is a chance for having varying levels of crown scorch. Now, as with the strip head fire, if you keep temperatures below 60 degrees, that'll help minimize some of the crown scorch that could happen um, using this, this technique. If your temperature's above that, there's more likelihood that you will see crown scorch um, using this firing technique as well. One of the uh, advantages of the flanking fire technique is it allows for these large, or allows for large or small areas to be um, treated in a very efficient and quick manner, um, which can help reduce cost. And another benefit is you don't have to put um, as many or any uh, fire control lines in to break up the unit because of the way the unit is being um, fired um, doesn't call for that. So fewer control lines will also dictate, you know, lower costs as well. Um, but when using this firing technique, communication um, between those igniters or lighters um, is critical because they need to stay together at the same rate and be able to see each other across the way so that one person doesn't get ahead of another person and if there is a wind shift, the fire doesn't entrap them. Um, the flanking fire technique is, is also good for securing flanks um, when you're using other techniques such as backing fire and or um, strip head fire. Next, we're going to cover point source firing, or what we call sometimes call it dot firing. Sometimes people refer to it as spot fires, but in the wildfire world, we don't like to use the word spot fire because spots indicate a control issue. So the lingo is call it a point source or dot fire. And we're going to watch a short video again that's going to demonstrate how a point source firing is conducted. The point source fire ignition technique is a modified version of the strip head fire. Instead of lines, personnel leave spots of fire as they walk across the site. The first line of spots is started on the downwind side of the site. Spots should be placed the same distance apart to ensure predictable fire behavior. Point source fires burn in all directions, but most fuels are consumed by the head and flanking portions of the fire. The intensity of point source fires is intermediate between head fires and backing fires. Managers can increase or decrease the intensity of the fire by changing both the distance between lines and the distance between spots. Intensity of the fire will be increased when two spots converge. Because point source fires burn in all directions, they often create a mosaic of burning intensities that result in diversity for wildlife. Now, with point source firing, again, since it's repetition, always secure your downwind baseline first with that backing fire. Um, you assume that the predominant fire effects are going to be created through both head, heading fire, flanking fire, and then less so backing fire. Because as those spots grow, they're going to end up merging. They're going to create different intensities um, as those spots um, get closer, there's going to be a greater intensity. And we'll create more of a mosaic um, across the landscape. If the conditions are ideal for backing fire, um, considering the use of a point source fire may not be a good idea um, because if it's, if it's burning really well with a backing fire, it's probably going to burn too well with the point source uh, or dot ignition. Um, ignition technique. Um, 
Point source fires can be used with variable wind directions. So in, on those days where you do have that variable wind direction, and the flanking fire is not a good option, perhaps point source is that option to fill that gap. Um, again, in span, wind speeds of one to two miles an hour, um, very similar to some of the, uh, the heading fire techniques requirements. Um, you get too high of an in-stand wind speed, uh, you're going to have um, um, intensity problems potentially and uh, relating back into um, containment issues. Some of the standard ignition patterns are two chains by two chains for, uh, for iron burning. Um, but if you're trying to reduce crown scorch on a stand, you want one and a half chains by one chain in a pattern. So one chain back from the, the baseline or other spots that you've lit or uh, points that you've lit, and then one and a half chains apart from the spots. So one chain deep and then one and a half chains apart from each dot that you light. That will help reduce crown scorch. If those dots get too close together, what will happen is as those dots um, merge, it will turn into a strip or heading fire. And if that space is too great, it's going to have greater fire intensity. It's going to create greater crown scorch as a result. Um, lastly, when you're using the point source or dot ignition method, um, you need to continuously monitor the effects of the fire from the ignition patterns, and you, you're going to have to um, mitigate those, uh, those effects by um, adjusting your, uh, your firing uh, ignition um, pattern accordingly. Um, that may be putting things closer together, maybe spacing them out a little bit, or it could be just changing the firing technique altogether. Um, there is not a day go by that when you do a prescribed fire and you use the point source that you don't have to adjust. Um, you're going to have to be dynamic and fluid as you're doing it and be receptive to what the fire effects are produced um, from the technique and the, uh, the adjustments that you make. The last firing technique that we're going to discuss is the ring fire. And once again, we will watch a short video on ring fire um, that will describe how it's implemented. Another type of burn that you might consider is what's called a ring fire. In this type of situation, you're actually walking around in a ring and um, taking the fire with you as you go. So you're burning from the outside, and the fire will actually uh, move inwards to the center of the burn unit. Uh, oftentimes, this type of burn is used to try to get the smoke up and out of an area faster. So if you're trying to, um, say you have a smoke-sensitive area that you're trying to avoid and you don't want the smoke to settle there, you might consider using a ring fire to get that smoke up and out as quickly as possible and not land on your smoke-sensitive areas. Some of the factors that are associated with uh, center and or circular ring firing are um, it's it's a method that can be used in areas that have been logged where there's not a lot of overstory vegetation and there's not a lot of uh, uh, surface, or not surface fuels, but uh, understory brush. Um, because of this technique utilizes both backing, flanking, dot, and head fire, uh, you're going to have significant um, increase in intensity if you're using the wrong fuel types. This technique works best in, in um, days with lighter winds, and it shouldn't be used to burn underbrush um, because it will create severe fire effects. Um, because all of these different firing techniques that create different fire effects um, are being utilized all at once. So. It typically is a good method for working in um, grass fields or uh, logging debris slash fields and uh, so forth. 
when you're using this technique, sometimes one or, or even several spots can be not ignited in the center of the unit and um, before the uh, perimeter around it is, is ignit ignited. Again, uh, as with all of the firing techniques, you know, establishing that, that black line or that, uh, that baseline first with that backing fire is critical. Um, one of the um, effects of uh, ring firing technique is it creates a, a very strong uh, convective column. And that column can be really good for um, getting lift of the smoke and getting it up and over um, smoke sensitive areas. But along with that lift that's generated, getting that smoke out, what happens with that convective column is it creates a potential containment issue because of that high fire intensity that can happen in these uh, with this firing technique. Embers can be loft um, great heights and distances, um, and potentially could um, you know land out of the uh, predetermined unit and create a spot fire, which would entail the uh, would not be good uh, for your prescribed burn. Some of the prescribed burn um, considerations that you should uh, take into account when planning a, a burn is, again, what is your resource objective? Are you trying to you just reduce the underbrush? Are you trying to do site prep for the site? Um, you know, prep a seed bed? Are you looking to just reduce hazardous fuels? Are you trying to create habitat? Um, are you trying to create mosaics, um, you know, patches of uh, um, in the canopy, all those things need to be considered. And those objectives are going to help dictate the types of firing techniques that you're going to use. Um, in addition, those firing techniques are going to play, are going to play a large part uh, or be used um, based on what those fuels and the size of the area to be burned is. So not every technique is going to create uh, a resource objective that is uh, uh, necessary but, um, if the fuels um, on that site are uh, are not um, uh, conducive uh, to make that uh, objective a reality. Another thing you need to concern yourself with is uh, what are the smoke sensitive areas in 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 around the uh, the burn site. Um, are there major roads? Is there um, uh, communities? Is there schools or hospitals um, that potentially could be downwind? Um, you need to mitigate these uh, smoke sensitive areas and think about wind directions and fire techniques that will help mitigate these smoke problems that will um, potentially arise um, while conducting a prescribed burn. Some of those smoke management, as we talked about that ring firing technique, where it is applicable, um, that firing technique can get uh, the smoke to get lifted and put up and over stuff at times. But used in the wrong situation, it can create a containment um, problem. So make sure you're selecting the right firing technique to mitigate the uh, um, smoke sensitive management areas um, correctly. Also, you need to consider what is the suitable weather and fuel conditions. Um, do you want it, uh, the fuel moisture to be up so there's less consumption, um, or do you want it drier so that you get deeper consumption into the ground and uh, greater fire effects, long-term fire effects on that stand if you're looking to create wildlife habitat patches? Uh, with all those things considered, you're going to be is uh, going to help dictate what your holding and contingency resources are and, and what is necessary to con conduct that burn. You know, is there a, a lot of fuels there? Um, are the fire techniques that you're utilizing going to create more of a, uh, a holding issue? Um, you're going to have to mitigate those uh, concerns in your plan. And then also safety on and off the burn. Um, Mitigating those uh, safety concerns, um, whether it's uh, uh, 
snags or trees that are uh, going to continue to burn on the site or the smoke that's uh, blowing up potentially across the road or off-site um, because that can create a safety concern for um, individuals who are not partaking in the burn. Um, also, the uh, legal considerations, permits and notifications. Uh, the permits are issued by the New Jersey Forest Fire Service, and when those permits are issued, they tend to have the um, notifications listed out on there that a landowner or uh, a professional would need to follow um, before igniting the burn. And then most importantly is monitoring and evaluating the burn and those fire effects um, after and during the burn itself. As we described with the uh, point source and even with all the firing techniques, um, you should continuously evaluate the effects that you're getting with that prescribed fire and that firing technique and make adjustments to make sure that you are going to continue to meet those resource objectives that you, you set out to accomplish with that burn in the first place. Um, so that monitoring is, you know, before the burn starts to during the burn and then after, well after the burn has taken place. You need to keep all of those pieces or um, evaluations in mind um, so that it helps you in the future as you conduct more prescribed fires. And with that, I'm going to move on and turn over the presentation to Betsy McShane. Betsy? Thank you, Jeremy. Let's switch gears now and start discussing NRCS conservation activities and practices related to prescribed burning. Our field employees are quite familiar with where to find our conservation practices and other technical information but we would like to ensure that all of our partners are aware of this as well. On the NRCS homepage, take a look at the right-hand side for Field Office Technical Guide. It's a little bit of a cryptic location of where to go to next, but if you look at the bottom left, um, there is a spot where you can see Visit Your State Field Office Technical Guide, the FOTG. The field office technical guide encompasses a ton of information. Each of these sections are customized by each state as well. Before you can actually get into each of the sections, first select the state in which you are working. For all of our professional foresters that will be writing conservation activity plans, or CAPS, and for our NRCS conservation planners that will be certifying these, those plans, Let's spend a little time to focus on the section labeled FY 2018 and FY 2019 CAP. Most of us are familiar with CAP 106 Forest Management Plan, but today we'll focus on CAP 112 Prescribed Burning Plan. Let's go through the CAP 112 so that all TSPs and potential TSPs can see what we expect in the plan and so that the NRCS employees know what to look for when they are asked to certify a CAP prescribed burning plan. So each of the CAP activity plans have a definition. The definition for prescribed burning is a prescribed burning conservation activity plan is a site specific plan developed for a client which addresses one or more resource concerns on land through the use of fire for any of the following purposes. And you can see that there are multiple purposes that prescribed burning can be used for. Everything from reducing wildfire hazard to improving plant production quantity and quantity or quality, or even for enhancing seed and seedling production. The prescribed burning plan will meet NRCS quality criteria for rangeland, pasture, grazed, woodland health, and productivity, and other identified resource concerns. It will comply with federal, state, tribal, and local laws, regulations, and permit requirements regarding outdoor burning, fire control, smoke management, and air quality. 
follow any additional criteria established in NRC, NRCS state-specific standards and specifications for prescribed burning for the state in which the CAP 112 is planned. And very importantly, the CAP 112 plan will meet the client's resource objectives. In order for NRCS to provide financial assistance, the plan must be written by a certified technical service provider, a TSP. The TSP has met NRCS qualifications and is willing to write the plan according to our specifications, correctly utilizing our format and our conservation practices. So what information should be included in a CAP 112? Well, backgrounds on the landowner and the site should be included, as well as resource management objectives, a description of existing conditions, such as cover locations of important objects or natural features, and all resource concerns not meeting what we call quality criteria. We'll elaborate a little bit more on number four. Number four on the preceding slide was all resource concerns. Remember that purposes listed in earlier in the document. They were the control vegetation on rangeland, pasture land, forest land, hayland, et cetera. Things like controlling plant disease, reducing wildfire hazards, improving wildlife habitat, facilitating grazing or browsing animals. The actual resource concern addressed through the, this practices are degraded plant condition and inadequate habitat for fish and wildlife. Other items that are to be included in a CAP 112 are the desired future conditions, the post-burn vegetative cover, and the plant species composition, and then prescribed burn plan documentation such as a conservation plan, which includes the scale of the plan, a north arrow, plant and existing boundaries, such as fields and paddocks, locations of physical resources, such as watering systems, fences and gates, the land use should be identified, the map should also have appropriate map symbols, identification of forage suitability groups and or ecological sites by fields, and a soils legend. In a burn plan map, the burn ignition point should be delineated, the burn prescription with the wind direction and firing sequence delineated, the location of crews and equipment, safety zones should all be outlined on the burn plan map, the resource concerns addressed by the prescribed burn plan need to be identified, required weather and environmental conditions for burn prescriptions, including but not limited to temperature, relative humidity, wind speed, wind direction, and soil moisture, a description of the burning method to be used, and a pre-burn preparation. And here's an example of what one of those burn plan maps looks like. Other things that are to be included in the CAP 112 are ignition method and firing sequence, notification checklist of adjoining neighbors, local fire departments, and public safety as officials as appropriate, equipment and materials checklist, personnel assignments, and need safety requirements, the smoke management plan, the post-burn evaluation criteria, the post-fire vegetative monitoring plan with methods and frequency defined, operation and maintenance plan for all practices, a copy of a current certificate or license by the designated agency in states where certification or licensing is required for prescribed burning activity, approval signatures, and number 16, the conservation plan, which is the record of decisions, to address the resource needs for the prescribed burning plan. The record of decisions shall include the planned practice, 
the schedule for implementation, and site-specific specifications to apply the conservation practice. The site-specific specifications can be on an NRCS job sheet available for the conservation practice or in a narrative form. The plan may include, but are not limited to, conservation practices that will be listed on the next slide. These particular practices require site-specific specifications. We'll show examples of the job sheets later and when we discuss some of these practices individually. Here are examples of other practices that are typically associated with conservation plans that involve burning. Although the CAP doesn't necessarily require site-specific specifications for these practices, we have job sheets for many of these that planners typically use. As part of the CAP 12, the technical service provider is supposed to provide a list of deliverables for the clients and a hard copy of the plan that includes a cover page, all of the items that we just discussed, the soils map and appropriate soil description, ecological site descriptions, and a map where, where available. Ecological site descriptions are not currently available in New Jersey. Resource assessment results in applicable, if applicable, wind and water erosion and others that may be needed. And for those practices that were listed as requiring site-specific specifications, those specs should be prepared and show how each practice will be applied, when the practice will be applied, and the extent that will be applied. For all other planned practices, identify in the plan when the practice will be applied, the extent, the practice location, and for structural practices, locate those practices on a conservation plan map. The technical service provider is also responsible for deliverables to our field offices. And those include a hard copy or an electronic copy of the client's plan and other appropriate digital supporting documents, such as a digital conservation plan with fields, features, and structural practices located, and a soils map as well. If all of those things are included, the cap is complete. So now let's go to section four of the field office technical guide and talk about conservation practice standards related to prescribed burning. Here's an example of one of the practices that's in the field office technical guide, fire break, practice code 394. When you find fire break in our field office technical guide, in addition to seeing the standard itself, you'll also see that there's a job sheet and some other items. One practice that is essential to prescribed burning is our prescribed burning practice, code 338. All of our field office technical guide standards are laid out in a similar manner. There's the name of the practice, the units it's measured in, in this case it's acres. Each practice has a code number, and listed is the definition of the practice and the purpose. There are quite a few for this particular practice. The definition is that a controlled fire is applied to a predetermined area. And of the many purposes include control undesirable vegetation, prepare sites for harvesting, planting, or seeding, control plant disease, reduce wildfire hazard, improve wildlife habitat, improve plant production quantity and or quality, remove slash and debris, enhance seed and seedling production, facilitate distribu the distribution of grazing and browsing animals, and restore and maintain ecological sites. After the purpose, purposes are listed, each conservation practice 
also lists criteria that is applicable to all of those purposes. The criteria need to each be addressed. Most often we would defer to the prescribed burn plan or permit that the landowner applies for for all of the information that's listed here in the criteria for prescribed burning. Additionally, the procedure equipment and the number of trained personnel shall be adequate to accomplish the intended purposes. The expected weather conditions, human and vehicular traffic that may be impeded by heat or smoke, liability and safety and health precautions shall be integrated into the timing, location, and expected intensity of the burn. Timing of burning will be commensurate with soil and site conditions to maintain the site productivity and minimize effects on soil erosion and soil properties, such as structure and soil moisture. Weather parameters and other data that affect fire behavior should be monitored during the burn. Carbon release should be minimized by the timing and burn intensity. Consider the location of utilities, such as electric power lines and natural gas pipelines to prevent damage to the utility and avoid personal injury. Smoke impacts must be considered before the burn and should be monitored during the burn. Considerations is the next part of a field office technical guide practice standard. In this case, the considerations are burning should be managed with consideration for wildlife needs, such as nesting, feeding, and cover. Existing barriers, such as lakes, streams, wetlands, roads, and constructed, constructed fire breaks are important to the design and layout of this practice. Notify adjoining landowners, local fire departments, and public safety officials as appropriate within the air shed prior to burning. Plans and specifications are the following for prescribed burning. NRCS employees that have received this awareness training are qualified to recommend this practice to a landowner, but the actual burn plan should be prepared by someone with more extensive training. Description of the burn area, including present vegetative cover, Objective and timing of burn. The prescribed burn season is October 1st to March 15th. The acceptable conditions for prescribed burning. Preparation of the area of burning include dimensions, including dimensions. The personnel needed and the equipment, including safety equipment needed to perform the burn. Special precaution areas and firing techniques. Now this is all state info specific information, and this will be updated as the state of New Jersey develops some of its new policies and those are finalized. Requires some operation and maintenance. Here is some standard language that should be included in plans. Basically, we have to make sure that we're using this practice under the right conditions with the right equipment and with proper man monitoring post-burn for safety. Let's talk about practices that are often used in conjunction with prescribed burning. Fuel breaks are a strip or block of land on which vegetation has been reduced, not eliminated, and or modified to control or diminish the risk of spread of fire crossing the strip or block of land. The recommended modification within the fuel break should consist of an average of a 50% reduction of canopy cover across the treatment area and up to 100% reduction in understory fuels. This fuel modification must be maintained over time. You can see in this slide a photo of a location before it has been treated to create a fuel break and after. How large of an area should be treated with a fuel break? Well, it is based on the fire hazard level. In areas where there is a moderate fire hazard level, the minimum size is a 30-foot recommended. 
If it has a high fire hazard area, 37 feet is the minimum recommended size. In extreme fire hazard areas, a 100 foot minimum is recommended. The fire hazard classification in New Jersey is based on the NJDEP land cover land type data. In addition to the basic information that is included in our conservation practice standard, we also have a job sheet that can help spell out the specifics of a practice. Remember that fuel break is one of those practices that as site-specific specifications are required in a CAP 112. You can see that the job sheet includes a lot of basic information at the top about the site. As you scroll down, this portion spells out the conditions of what the conditions are right now and what they're expected to be post-treatment, which we call the applied condition. It is also specified with a layout sketch and drawing of the practice and where it's to be located. After a practice has been implemented, it is the field office of NRCS's responsibility to certify that it has been implemented correctly. And we can refer back to that job sheet when it comes time to certify the practice and make sure that it has been correctly implemented and therefore we can make a payment to the landowner. For most of our agronomic practices, we have a practice certification that includes basic information listed at the top including the practice name, the year it's implemented, the farm, tract, and field, who was the NRCS employee responsible for checking it out or certifying the practice, and ensuring that they have the proper job approval authority level to certify that practice. And we also ask that photos of the site be attached, as well as a map showing the location of the practice that was implemented. The certifying planner has three choices. They can either check that the practice has been implemented according to our standards and spe specifications, or that it was implemented with some changes, but they are acceptable and still meet our standards and specs. Or the third option is that there are deficiencies and it does not meet our standards or specifications. Let's talk about another common practice, fire breaks. Fire breaks um, are applicable on all land uses where protection from wildfire is needed or prescribed burning is applied. The criteria for fire, break, fire breaks are that they may be temporary or permanent, can be fire resistant vegetation, which are non flammable materials, bare ground or a combination. They should be sufficient in width and length to contain the expected fire. If you're using fire resistant vegetation, which is not very common in New Jersey, it must be non-invasive and managed to prevent growth of flammable vegetation. Some of the considerations are electric lines that may conduct electricity, Consider the effects on fish and wildlife. Locate fire breaks near ridges and valley bottoms. Locate them on the contour to reduce erosion. Consider multiple uses, such as lanes in our pine barren. Consider the effects on installation on cultural resources, threatened and endangered species, natural areas, and wetlands the usual topics that are covered in our NEPA compliance requirements. And here's what a fire break can look like. So what are the differences between a fire break, which is our 394 standard, versus a fuel break, which is the 338, 383 standard that we mentioned before? Well, fire breaks are strips a bare soil or fire-retarding fire vegetation meant to stop or control fire. 
Fuel breaks are strips or blocks of vegetation that have been altered, reduced, to slow or control a fire. Now Evan Madlinger will talk about some other practices commonly used in combination with prescribed burning. How's it going all? I hope you guys are hanging in well. Um, thanks, Betsy. I'm just going to go over uh, briefly here a few uh, of the supporting practices that uh, we can use in addition to some of the practices that Betsy went over. So here for this slide on the brush management standard, you can see where the conditions where practice applies. So um, what we just kind of wanted to point out here is, is that for prescribed fire, it, it, we can use it as a tool, but it can't meet the brush management standard. Um, you'd use prescribed fire separately. So fire to manage brush would be used under the prescribed fire, uh, prescribed burning standard, not under the brush management standard, you know, where we'd be doing our traditional more chemical and mechanical uh, control. Um, on the flip side, you can sometimes do prescribed fire in lieu of brush management. So an example I was thinking of here is, is when you get some of these sites in North Jersey that are completely inundated with barberry, uh, potentially we might be able to save the mechanical chemical means of controlling that and just send fire through, and that might take care of the problem for us. Um, so that's definitely something to, think, to keep in mind now as we strive to use this practice more in the landscape. Um, Again, here, we're just pointing out under the additional criteria of the standard, we can use this to manage fuel loads to achieve desired conditions. So, um, you know, there's going to be times potentially where, especially I think more maybe in South Jersey, where you would actually uh, want to reduce some of that fuel load using this standard prior to setting prescribed fire through. So just something to kind of find there. The next practice I wanted to talk about is those successional habitat our 647 uh, standard here. Um, you can see some of the things listed from the, in, uh, within the standard here, the definition and purpose and a condition where it's applied. So, you know, in general, this is a standard that we use a lot in when we do warm season grass plantings or when we're doing some young forest habitat uh, type activities. And uh, often when we, or, you know, potentially often when we use this standard, there might be opportunities to do some prescribed burning uh, when we use this. Um, one of the things here we just wanted to point under under the conditions is is that uh, we do want to keep in mind that the use of natural fire breaks or or develop them if you are planning to use prescribed fire. Uh, a lot of you know that have done work with with Betsy and I over the years. Early successional habitat in New Jersey is not going to stay in an early successional state for very long um, if we don't intervene with some management. So often in the past that's been mowing or potentially chemical treatments, but here again, you know, we can look at using prescribed fire. And I'm actually going to talk about that a little bit more as we get to my uh, case study. Um, lastly, I'm going to talk about forest stand improvement, another very common practice we use, um, oftentimes, you know, for doing sanding or sometimes on our, our golden wing sites we'll do, or our quail sites, we might use this standard to create some uh, kind of heavy openings out on the landscape. Um, but one of the things that we might not be thinking about, as you can see here in the purpose for forest stand improvement, we actually talk about its ability to reduce fire risk and hazard and facilitate prescribed burning. Um, and we'll look at that here um, under additional criteria to reduce for, uh, fire risk and hazard you can see uh, we want to reduce the we can use this to reduce the stocking rates um, of those trees and you know I think of this a lot when we look at the pine barrens and if you compare a stand that's been managed to a stand that's not been managed the stands that have not been managed oftentimes are are very have a very high stocking density trees are very close together um, and it can cause safety hazard um, you know, on the landscape. So sanding those trees down using this standard um, can actually help you when it comes to a fire safety standard. Um, and actually says this here, minimize crown of crown spread of fire, which, you know, Jeremy would be able to tell you is a very dangerous fire situation and, and where you get loss of life and property. So um, very important for this. And in addition to that, you can see that there's some supporting practices as well, fuel break, woody residue treatment, some of the others. So again, not maybe something you're always thinking about with forest stand improvement, but definitely a practice that we can use to really help mitigate some uh, some issues with fire. 
with forest trails and landings, another practice we've used often, you might think about this as, you know, a trail in the woods that is put in to facilitate management of a uh, landowner's forest. Very often that, that is indeed the case. Um, but what we may not often think about is, is that these forest trails also can provide access for, again, management for fire, fire safety issues, um, allowing access to get back to manage uh, or to get um, forest fire personnel to sites if, if there is a fire, um, you know, for fire suppression. And actually, in and of itself, the forest trail can actually be a break, and we talked about that with some of Jeremy's prescribed burning stuff and, and with Betsy talking about fuel and fire breaks. So the trail itself here, we see a good example of where, um, you know, uh, this could actually help stop a fire from spreading. Um, so kind of a dual purpose there. So with that, that kind of concludes some of the major supporting practices. I did want to talk about, uh, Betsy and I both have a case study to talk to you about. Um, I'm going to go first, talking to you about um, something a little different here in North Jersey. Uh, I want to try to use more in the landscape, some of this has been used in other states, and it's using prescribed burning to actually weed some of these young forest sites that we have on the landscape, particularly in North Jersey, that we've created with, with our Golden Wing initiative. So here's a site. This was a cut that we did. It's at Hudson Farm in, in Morris County. So I know some of our staff, there's been quite a few out there, and some of the consulting foresters on the line are listening to this webinar. You guys have been out there, too, on some of the tours that we've done. So this is a Golden Link site we did. In this picture, it's about four years old. And you're going to have to take my word for it a little bit because it's leaf-off conditions uh, here. But um, what you might be able to tell, uh, if you know tree species, is it, it's got a fair amount of birch in particular in the picture. There was also some beech, and we were getting some oaks, which was good. You know, the Goldwing Warbler habitat, they're okay with the diversity on the landscape here. The, the habitat structure is very good. So from, from the bird itself, they were, they're pretty happy with the way this was coming back. But, you know, silviculturally, when we do these cuts, we do try to give some preference to the oaks and the hickories, try to, try to get them regenerating. And the less of the, the birch and the beech and the maple. So here, this is, you know, a little bit concerning us as it was coming back pretty heavy in, in the birch and the beech. And so one of the things that we talked about here, um, now while NRCS paid for the cut here, um, New Jersey Audubon had been working with Hudson Farm on a grant that they have uh, that I assisted with technically um, on getting some prescribed fire on the landscape in some of these northern deciduous uh, forest types. So in addition to that, New Jersey Forest Fire was also a, a partner on this. And, you know, with assistance from the grant money that New Jersey Audubon had and obviously with Hudson Farm allowing it to be done on the property, New Jersey Forest Fire Service uh, came and they did send fire through this site. Um, and the results were very good. What we could see here was just that the fire went through, and it actually, again, it, it, it's, it's hard to see it in a picture if you, if you saw it on site, but what you would see if you kind of walk through this, and you can tell in a picture that, that it, the fire did indeed actually kill a lot of the birch and beech, the less desirable, and if you walk through that, you'd actually see the, the oaks are there that we wanted. So this was very successful, good little example, one of the uh, first times we've done this in New Jersey. Uh, like I said, they've done it in other states, but this was kind of our first attempt at it. Um, and what was neat about it um, was it saves a lot of manpower. If you think if, if you were going to try to go in and mechanically or chemically you know, go after the birch and the beach, you can imagine the effort that would take, in, you know, and you contrast that with the forest fire coming and running through a fire through that and the, and the great results that we got, cheaper, faster, and just as effective. And the reason that works is that the oaks, we, you know, in the south, in south Jersey, we think about the pine, um, the pine barrens and the pitch pine being adapted to fire, but also in North Jersey, some of the tree species are more adapted to fire than others, and, and oaks and hickories being more fire adapted, they can withstand the fire coming through, uh, where some of the thinner bark species, like the birch and beech and maple, cannot. And we think this was a major player going back through history on how New Jersey, particularly North Jersey, was an oak hickory dominated uh, forest type due to disturbances like fire. Um, and, it, and it's too much to go into now, but you can go through and see a bunch of the fire research they have out there. Um, about, you know, the frequency of fire and, and, and the return, you know, how often fire would be on the landscape. And it's a lot more uh, recent or happened a lot more often than you thought. You know, at one time they thought it was, you know, maybe 50 years, and now there's research showing that maybe every 12 years, you know, pre-European 
these uh, forest types off fire. So it's really uh, pretty neat and something we can do. Um, again, here's just kind of another picture, maybe even a little bit better, kind of showing that, uh, you know, it did kill some of the, the not uh, the non desirable species here. Um, and it's something we have to consider because looking, I've even been on some trainings and stuff and taken some tours of some sites, and, and while it's great that we're doing these young forest cuts and we're getting good results, regeneration, it's been shown to me uh, through several examples that if you don't manage um, you know, seven to ten years prior, you might not get the results that you really want. Um, one good instance I saw was out of Virginia. One thing we don't think about here, but in Virginia, they get a lot of tulip poplar that comes in if they don't do any kind of follow-up management. So you might be going after a pinhickory, but you, you get a bunch of tulip poplar. And not that that's bad. It just depends on what your objectives are. And if your objectives are to get oak and hickory, you don't want a bunch of tulip poplar. So it's definitely something to consider. It's something I'm really looking forward to. I wanted to just kind of share this example a little different. You know, I think, again, we kind of think of the pine barrens with the scrap fire and warm season grasses, but here's a situation where we could get this uh, on the landscape a lot more. I know a lot of the forests are about it, and I think it could be a really good tool for us. Uh, I did also just want to go in and talk a little bit about some of the practices. So. On this particular site, we did do some brush management prior to doing the activity. Uh, there is particularly some barberry that was sprayed uh, out on the site uh, prior to even the forest cut. So I was kind of thinking here, just kind of walk you through what we used to get to the situation you saw there. So again, some barberry we sprayed up front, very common on some of these forestry sites that we may look to do some of that brush management. Um, but we didn't need to on this particular site, but we also have the 315 standard, which is herbaceous weed control. That would be obviously used on more herbaceous plants where the brush management is targeted more toward woody plants. For the forest stand improvement, um, we talked about that already. Uh, also, early successional habitat, those are two practices that we often use to actually do the cut um, on sites like this. So the forest stand improvement, and this is sometimes uh, a little hard for the consultants to wrap their heads around because in their world, from a professional silvicultural standpoint as a forester, this doesn't make a lot of sense. But in NRCS world, you know, we have these standards of so forest stand improvement when we looked at it before, you're probably aware is a, a big catch-all uh, practice that we have. So here, actually, we use that practice to create kind of the, the big opening, and it made sense for us under that, even though you might think growth successional habitat would, would make more sense. And it actually, the way we're set up, the forest state improvement made more sense to do the big cut. Um, on this particular site, we didn't use growth successional, but we will use that very often, particularly for shelter wood cuts. Or, or it's in there. Uh, that's where you'll see us use really special habitat a lot on, on some of the heavier cuts in North Jersey. And then lastly, as Betsy went over very well in her part of the presentation, the prescribed burning standard, which we use to treat that. And again, to kind of go back to my presentation, that, that's a good example there um, where we're using prescribed, prescribed burning to actually uh, control some brush, but we are using that standard. We're not using the, the brush management standard with the fire. We're using the prescribed burning uh, standard there. So with that, that includes my part of it, and I'll go ahead and turn it over to Betsy for her case study in the Pine Barrens. Thanks, Evan. Now we have a case study that involves the implementation of prescribed burning for the restoration of a Pine Barren savanna habitat. This is a project that we worked on with a nonprofit organization in the Pine Barrens that is interested in improving their habitat for pine barren savanna. As Evan mentioned before, much of the forested land cover in the pine barrens has been undermanaged and is quite overstocked to what could be considered a dangerous level at this point. So one of the first things that we did with this organization is to implement forest stand improvement. So working with a professional forester, they implemented their full stroke plan and treated the land to get it into the proper stocking rate. This involved removing quite a bit of the forested layer using heavy equipment, as well as some smaller equipment. And here are some examples of the typical equipment that is used to do the work. And the resulting habitat is a largely forested landscape with some large areas of early successional habitat 
incorporated as well. In addition to the forest sand improvement practice, we also used our fire break standard. Once the fire breaks were implemented and installed properly, this facilitated implementing our prescribed burning plan. And you can see that in some areas, it was more of a less intense burn than forested portions of the property. And then some areas were more purposely intensely burned. After the burning was completed, some of these areas are now in the goal habitat of savannas, areas of early successional habitat interspersed with more heavily treed areas. One thing that we did additionally on this project was partner with the USDA's Plants Materials Center, which is located in Cape Moon, New Jersey, and we used their assistance to harvest native seed from the property. The PMC then took that seed back to their facility and cleaned it. And then the clean seed was re returned to the property owners and used on site. Once those areas have been seeded with the native vegetation, they're maintained over time using repeat prescribed burning. This is routinely done on a regular basis to maintain that early successional habitat. So what does a conservation plan look like for a site like this? Well, the conservation plan lists the objectives of the landowner and the practices to be implemented and the schedule for implementation. So as a review for this site, some of the practices that we included were brush management, as well as early successional habitat development and management, fire breaks, forest sand improvement, and there may be a couple of different forest sand improvement practicing solicit with different levels or intensity of planned practices on the site. Prescribed burning, of course, was also a practice that is included in the conservation plan. If we go back to the, our technical guide, once we've recommended practices to landowners, landowners are able to apply for our conservation programs, like our Environmental Quality Incentives Program, EQIP. Payment information can be found in Section 1 of the Field Office Technical Guide. If you click on the link on the right, it will bring you to a website. And here is a look at that website. Once you're here, you want to scroll down and choose New Jersey. That will bring up the New Jersey payment schedule. These are available for each of our different cost share programs. In particular, the Environmental Quality Incentives Program was used to implement the conservation plan that's used in our case study. Once you choose the EQIP payment schedule, you'll see all of the included practices that are available through that program. As you can see, for each of the practices, there are multiple choices of what we call scenarios for each of the practices. This, for example, is all the multiple scenarios related to fire breaks. In addition to just the the payment, you can find out more specific details of how each of those scenarios and what is were developed and what is included in that price. If you go back to the New Jersey payment schedules and choose the bottom option of practice scenarios, 
you'll see all the detailed information that went into developing those prices. On this slide, we can take a look at one of those payment scenarios. And this page describes what a typical scenario would look like and what they had in mind when they were developing those payments. You can see that there's a before and an after description. Scrolling down a bit further, you'll see the equipment, labor, and materials, and units of each that were used to develop the cost. Looking at this will help you choose which payment is closest to what your project entails. Remember that these are just typical. Choose the most appropriate, but make sure that when you're planning a practice, you're thinking about meeting the conservation practice standard requirements, not just planning to match what's written here in the scenario. And with that, I'd like to turn it back over to Christine Hall. Thanks so much, Betsy. Well, folks, you've made it to the end here with us at this training. I want to thank all of you for joining us for this Prescribed Learning Awareness Training Webinar. And again, a huge, huge thanks to our speakers, Jeremy Weber, Betsy McShane, and Evan Madlinger. I also want to thank Hudson Farm for granting us permission to share the great conservation work that they've been doing on their property. I would find it really helpful to use case studies like that to see how these practices come together and how we can do this work with our customers. So we've covered a lot of ground during this webinar, but if after this training session you still have any unanswered uh, burning questions, you might say, feel free to reach out to any of the speakers from today's program. So I do want to note that anyone who attended both days of the Prescribed Burning Awareness Training in January that was held at the Rutgers Eco Complex, if you attended those days of training as well as this webinar, you will have completed the 16-hour NRCS training requirement. So if you're an NRCS employee, a partner conservation planner, a technical service provider, or are thinking about becoming a technical service provider or TSP, it's important that you have documentation of this training completion. So please email me, Christine Hall, so it's christine.hall at usda.gov to document that you completed this training webinar and to request your training certificate. Please uh, do me a favor and include in the subject line of your email the phrase prescribed burning training. That will help me sort through the emails and make sure that we get you your training certificate. So in closing, I hope that you are all staying safe and healthy, and I hope that this training webinar helped you to better understand how prescribed burns are implemented and how NRCS can assist with these practices.